Okay, so welcome everybody. Senate Education, May 26th, uh, continuing remote delivery of the committee's hearings in the COVID emergency. I see uh, Becky Wasserman uh, now, so we're good to go. So uh, what we're gonna do today is pursue two related discussions, which we kicked off at the beginning of last week. And that has to do with the House bill I think it's H209, school construction aid, and the idea behind their bill being to get an inventory of what, what's going on in the schools and um, also to get the state ultimately back into the business of helping with school construction more directly. So in the course of that discussion and speaking to Mr. Etkind, we developed a kind of parallel track where we were um, thinking about air circulation systems, HVAC systems, and the necessity of making sure those are updated and replaced if necessary before school opens. So I'm getting some feedback from somebody. I suspect it's the treasurer. Uh -oh. um, so we'll we'll see when, when you um, speak to us, Beth, but... Um, what I'd like to do uh, is start with Treasurer Pierce and have her speak generally to the idea of extending aid for school construction again. Uh, and I know she did that in the House Committee. So we'll hear her thinking. And then um, we may bounce a little between the two discussions, but the idea um, as the agenda lays it out is to deal with um, general school construction and that would include David Epstein, who's joined us from Truex Collins in Burlington. And then second, to go to the more specific discussion of air circulation systems due to the COVID um, crisis. So Treasurer Pierce, welcome. And uh, again, what we'd be looking for you to do is lay out your thinking generally about whether the state should or how should it properly uh, get involved again in school construction aid. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you on this issue. So from the outset, I would say that uh, we do need uh, to, you know, um, to work on our school construction, to uh, modernize some of our buildings. There's a lot of deferred maintenance, although we don't know how much and how much it costs at this point, and that's a, that's a big issue as you're, you're trying to develop a a funding and a financing plan. Uh, for me, those are two different things. Uh, financing is something where you capture or, or you leverage a stream of revenue and then pay it back over time um, so that you can use it in the current period. Uh, funding uh, is a, refers to generating a, a stream of revenue uh, um, and uh, that's important as well. A few years back, actually it was longer than that, 2009, uh, we worked on uh, something called the transportation infrastructure bonds to uh, and program to uh, uh, to assist us in taking a look at our, our our bridges and the quality of our bridges and the needs for improvements and a way to fund it. And we did both. First, we identified a revenue source, uh, which was a motor fuel transportation infrastructure assessment, and then looked at ways that uh, you could leverage those and uh, and get some work done um, on on the early side. So. Um, I think that that's kind of the standard that I would have as I'm looking at these things and uh, and how you could do it. One of the problems we have is that there's a, a, a great deal of need, um, whether it be um, uh, clean water, uh, housing, uh, energy efficiency, uh, and obviously uh, school buildings as well. And uh, I, there are merits with each one of those um, those pieces. We have in our capital budget right now, the, uh, that institutions committee works with, a, we're in the second year of a biennium. So when we recommend, that would be the, uh, the um, uh, CDAC uh, uh, committee, uh, which looks at the debt affordability uh, uh, that we have uh, in any given year. And we actually do this on a biennium basis. And our combined biennium, which is worth right now fiscal year uh, 20 is the um, uh, uh, Second year of that biennium, I believe it's uh, 123 million 180 thousand, and uh, uh, that is, you know, again over a two-year period, uh, we um, um, 
um, and I'm going to take that back. I think it's the second year, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, second uh, coming up for a uh, new biennium. But uh, the uh, uh, the amount that we're issuing is actually more than we're retiring. So the state debt, of, um, outstanding debt uh, is going up, continue, expected to continue to rise uh, from 2020 to 2025, and then remain in that range of kind of a steady period until about 2030. Uh, so that uh, that creates a uh, a, uh, a mismatch. So you have limited resources, and you have a, uh, a number of pressures uh, to, uh, to uh, basically fund or, or finance again that word uh, to, uh, through our debt authorizations. We are going to look at the parameters and the metrics related to uh, to the, our debt. Uh, this is going to be in in the fall. Uh, and we, uh, uh, the committee, the CDAC committee, will be taking a look at uh, what are the uh, metrics that we use and how do we compare ourselves peer to peer. You know, taking a look at other states that are highly rated. But more importantly, from my perspective, uh, the rating is extremely important. But more important is the cost to the taxpayer. And uh, for for us, uh, that uh, uh, that creates a little bit of an issue with how do you fit all those various needs in there. Um, so uh, I'm a little confused, and I will listen to your testimony about some of the dates. I saw a, a period suspends on um, a period of sus uh, suspending ends on 6:30:19. Uh, so I'm a little I'm, tr I'm trying to work through all the dates and the mechanics of that. But for me, um, in order to do this, uh, there are a couple of steps that need to be be done. Number one, uh, you need to set it um, you know define what the need is, uh, how much uh, 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 what is the situation in terms of our uh, school infrastructure and how much is it going to cost and when do you need to do it? Uh, and secondly, uh, you need to identify a revenue source uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, before you remove any suspension, you need to have both of those pieces. And we're willing to help. I know that finance and management has actually taken taken the lead role in, in, uh, in the bill at uh, 209. Uh, but uh, we're willing to, to have a conversation and help where we can. Uh, we are kind of limited in what uh, our resources right now. But uh, I think that before you say how uh, suspend and let's start doing this and the mechanics of that, you need to know how much is it going to cost and uh, and when when does that service need to be delivered? So the how needs to happen uh, before the uh, uh, the financing uh, or the what, excuse me, needs to happen before the how can happen. Uh, you know, I think that there is a concern that I have is that you may be setting an unattainable uh, 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 expectation by schools uh, if the funds are not available uh, to do this, and uh, you open up uh, uh, for some type of uh, of, um, of of renewal of this process before you know the, the scope. So I would recommend again uh, that uh, those steps need to happen to uh, identify the need uh, and again where is it, what type of need, uh, what's the cost, and then identify a revenue source um, to uh, to to manage that. If you take a look, uh, one of the uh, programs that people talk quite a bit about is uh, the um, Massachusetts School Building Authority. And they did both of those things, just as we did with the transportation infrastructure bonds. They first identified what that resource would be. Uh, and uh, uh, they took a, a, uh, some portion of a penny, or I'm not sure the amount off the sales tax to fund it. And, uh, and then they identified a process, an infrastructure procedural process and they did it within their, their existing uh, capital structure. So for me, that's important to be able to um, uh, uh, to take those steps. And uh, I would uh, 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 encourage the committee to look at it in, in that sequence of events. Thank you, Treasurer. Can I just clarify? So you started yeah. out talking about the difference between funding and financing. So in yep. other words, you would be against financing, but you are, um, you are tentatively for funding if there's an identified source. Yeah, I think that you have to fund it. Whether or not you finance it would have to be within the constraints of our, of our what's, a, what's a amount of debt that can be financed uh, by the state and uh, uh, be 
um, affordable by the taxpayers and within the confines of um, of, uh, of our peer-to-peer -peer relationships with the rating agencies. But again, taxpayer comes first in this one. Uh, but you need to identify a funding source, and then you may need to finance to leverage those uh, uh, revenues and bring them forward in the process. So what you're doing there is you're, you're leveraging a stream of revenue uh, and paying it back over time. Um, but you need there are two pieces to that. One, the revenue needs to uh, be identified, and second, uh, that uh, it needs to be within the uh, the limitations of uh, the Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee. And again, I would say that we are going to look at our metrics, but there's a lot of competition for resources. And going back to the my to one of my concluding remarks, I think that if you were to do this without having all the knowns um, um, uh, completed. Uh, you would end up creating an expectation that can't be met um, at the local level. So. If if I could just ask sure. one more question built on that. So the House mm -hmm. bill appropriates a million and a half dollars to um, hire parties capable of determining the need and mm -hmm. creating an apples to apples, uh, you know, compendium of deferred maintenance and projects around the state. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, are you implying at all that creating that would produce the expectation and we shouldn't do that without a defined revenue source? Uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, I think that's the first step you need to take um, is to do okay. the study. Um, and, and, and I would say that that study needs to emphasize the cost of doing it as well. So um, going back to what we did uh, when we created that um, revenue source, the um, uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, motor fuel transportation infrastructure assessment, that's a long winded uh, way of saying it. But uh, we first looked at the conditions of the, of the bridges, uh, the time period in which you needed to, um, to address them. So some, some timing and then identified a, a revenue stream to go with it and then talked about financing. Uh, and uh, I think what's changed since then is that our, uh, we recognize that our financing um, uh, levels need to be uh, constrained uh, so that uh, we're not putting undue burden on, um, on the taxpayer, uh, recognizing they also want good schools. And I thoroughly agree with that, but I think that you have to identify um, um, a viable, predictable revenue source. And I think that's not one-time dollars but dollars that are predictable over time, uh, that are reliable and, uh, and, uh, and measurable. And uh, uh, if we do that, I think we can meet this need. Questions from committee members for the treasurer. Uh, Senator Perchley. Thank you. Thank you, treasurer. The, I, I guess it's kind of a comment, just wanna hear your opinion on one of the, one of my questions of the House bill was that it's going to take a year and a half to do the study. We'll have a dollar figure mm -hmm. based on some standards that are developed. But without the knowing what the funding is, that, that could get old quick. And then in five years, if we still haven't figured out a funding source, as, as it took us a while to find the funding source for the Lake Champlain cleanup, you, you mm -hmm. it's almost like you have to go back and do another study on the, on the numbers. And I wondered, it, just kind of what you're thinking of how exact that has to be because we know generally that's a big number and I don't know how much it matters if it's you know 700 million or you know over over a billion like does it how exact does that have to be before we start talking about the funding source well I think that I used the old example of 2009 and you're correct that we did a similar process with the uh, clean water and our office was tasked with uh, the first step, which was to identify the cost and uh, the sectors that were impacted. We did not do that ourselves because we are not uh, experts in that area. What we did is worked very closely with uh, Agency of Natural Resources, Agriculture, um, uh, uh, Economic Development, worked with our partners. Uh, we had a fairly extensive process, uh, uh, 23 stakeholder meetings with a thousand people involved. So um, we did our homework, but we identified up front what the needs were and what the costs associated with those. And then we delved into what the financing opportunities were, whether it's federal money, whether it's state money. And if you take a look at the report, 
um, we did change some of those revenue sources over time, um, but we but it it served as a as an instrument to keep the focus on the issue and to um, and to work out uh, 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 a mo- a model for financing, and that involved a number of folks uh, uh, on the Senate and the House side, and uh, uh, I think it was very successful because we took those steps, and I think that that's what you need to do here. That doesn't mean you can't spend time investigating revenue sources and looking at that while you're con- uh, completing the uh, uh, the uh, needs assessment, but they do need to be coupled together. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say that uh, we were fairly comprehensive in our costs. We also recognized what costs were not in there, for instance, uh, general maintenance of those uh, facilities. So this was all capital investment that we were looking at. Um, but uh, it was successful because we took the steps in that order. Maybe you could do the same with school construction. Uh, well, we'd be happy to, to assist. Um, I will tell you that uh, right now uh, we're working on a number of projects, uh, including uh, one on housing, uh, acute, uh, including one on uh, the, 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 the colleges. Uh, we're kind of maxed out. Um, if you take a look at our budget, um, our our general administration, not our pension funds, but our general administration budget is less than uh, than we had in 2009. Uh, so we're a little stretched thin. If you'd like to give us the resources to do it, we'd be happy to give it a shot. Touche. Uh, any other questions for the treasurer? Okay, uh, Tre- Treasurer Pierce, thank you so much. Um, Please feel free to stay on uh, for the rest of the hearing if you like, but I know your time was tight today. Um, we, we appreciate the help. Uh, I will you... stay on as long as I can, uh, Mr. Chair, but, uh, and I wanna thank you folks for taking up this issue. It's extraordinarily important. Um, I, I um, try to approach things with a measured uh, way of doing things. Uh, cause I, because I believe that's the most successful. And, and the hope is that we get to a, a, um, a robust um, program for school construction. If I may, may I add one more piece to this, sir? Please. Okay, so I was looking at the uh, infrastructure uh, bill that was produced um, on the House side of um, Congress. Um, and it's, 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 it was at first introduced and it was fairly sizable. I, I'm, I'm it's over $900 million, uh, and I think it's a very good bill. I know that uh, that's been put on the back burner, and there will probably be some significant changes uh, in, that, uh, in that bill if, uh, if and when it gets, uh, gets to uh, both the House and the Senate. A uh, couple of things um, uh, that I saw in it. Number one, I was very pleased that it was green, uh, that there was a lot of money for, uh, uh, for environmental issues in it. Um, and that was uh, something I was very pleased to see. But what was noticeably absent was school building as, a, as an infrastructure category. And I would recommend to the extent uh, that we can uh, convey in that to, uh, to a congressional delegation and to others, that uh, that is, if they, and when they they pick up the uh, infrastructure bill again, which might provide some really needed assistance uh, at at the state level, uh, that uh, that that there be a push to make sure that it includes two things: one is school building, and secondly is affordable housing. Uh, and uh, that would be my uh, a second recommendation I would have for you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so. The treasurer, I guess, will um, hang on and listen. Secretary French, mm-hmm. welcome. Um, before you joined us, I was saying that we have two tracks going on today. One is general school construction, the discussion coming out of the House Bill H209. Um, love to hear your thoughts on that if you have any to share at this point. The other thing is um, Mr. Edkind, who you see on your screen probably got us thinking about planning for the fall and specifically air circulation systems in buildings because those have such a powerful effect on spread of the virus or um, inhibition of spread of the virus. So I'd like to stay with the general school construction theme first. We also have David Epstein from Truex Collins who's going to speak to that. But I, I wanted to ask your 
time constraints, uh, can you be with us for the whole hearing or do you need to leave at a certain point? Uh, um, thank you for inviting me, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm here till 3.30, that's what I have on my calendar. If that's oh, okay. Um, well, let me ask you this, do you have, well, let, let's uh, just to keep it simple, let's move to David Epstein, staying with the general school construction theme. Uh, just a reminder that the House bill called on AOE to um, help create new standards for buildings and then to um, hire a third party to conduct a needs assessment around the state at a cost of about $1.5 million for that. So David Epstein is uh, a an architect. I, I, is that correct, Mr. Epstein? That is correct. Thank you. Right. Right, and he has a special interest and experience set around school construction. So welcome and feel free, Mr. Epstein, to uh, tell us whatever you think we should know. Okay, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, as the chair said, my name um, my name's Dave Epstein. I am a architect. I've been working in schools for a long, long time. I do um, been working on K through 12 schools all over the state and internationally. Um, and I got involved with this, um, this effort. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, not this, probably two years ago, there was, uh, there was a, the first H209 um, arose and uh, I was active in trying to um, educate legislators about the need for school construction aid. Um, and then um, the last session, uh, there was a also a similar push and there was also a miscellaneous ed bill that called for a study group. And when that didn't pass, um, I decided why don't we have a study group anyway? And so I organized a group um, with Jeff Francis' help from the um, VSA of um, superintendents and uh, facility managers, business managers. Um, Secretary French joined us um, on occasion for a few meetings as well. So we had a very robust conversation, um, a series of meetings in fall of 2019 and spring um, in anticipation of this session. And so this session, um, we've met several times with house education, with institutions, we've met with Secretary Pierce. And so uh, Jeff Francis and I, he's been instrumental in helping uh, spearhead this effort to raise awareness about this important issue. Um, I've prepared a very short um, presentation that I'd like to walk you through if that would be okay. Um, sure. And I will share my screen if that's okay. I don't know what the... Can I, can, um, can that be made possible or? I, you know, uh, or, Jeannie. Or Jeannie, can you put the presentation up? Well, I did send it. Um, it may take me a while. I was not, in, uh, do, well, do I let, have it? Let me suggest. Uh, I, I think I emailed it to you. Can you allow me to share my screen and then I can. Um, Jeannie, did you put it up on the website? Yes, uh, it is on the website. Let's, let's do that then. So everybody can easily. Um, go to the website, pull it up, and then they can toggle back and forth between uh, these images and the thing. Whereas if you share the screen, we're all locked into. Okay. Just well, that. I may be, uh, let me, okay. Well, let, do people, um, let me know when you have it up. I, I have it up. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna, all set. Okay, good. Let me just arrange my screen here so I'm not looking off to the side. One second. Okay, so um, this is a very similar presentation that we gave to um, house education and house institutions back in February, but I've modified it, I've shortened it. And basically it's organized into four areas, just 
uh, we want to set the table in terms of providing the context for um, this whole conversation, talk about the opportunities, um, talk about the um, what our group felt were important uh, was important framework for a program because it's more than just providing school construction dollars to local districts. It's it, there's there needs to be a, a whole ecosystem rebuilt that includes standards um, and and other factors besides um, just giving money and then what we can do moving forward. So I, I kind of went David, through. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. I'm just wondering, Secretary French needs to leave at 3.30. Yeah. Not sure how long this presentation takes, but- It's, it's pretty quick. Okay. So um, if we can have a time certain of, uh, you know, five or 10 after, uh, three? Yep. I, I would say 10 after would, should not be a problem. Okay, great. And, we and can then always loop back to some of the points if, if, uh, if after the secretary want. goes, you can come back and finish. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sure. So uh, these are some of the groups that were part of our, our ad hoc working group uh, superintendents, architects, facility directors, um, the Edu Civic Education, the Vermont Community Bond Bank. Um, we, I'm going to the next slide. Uh, this is just a very brief history. Ironically, um, there were 2,500 school boards in 1892 and the, the, the state forced them to merge into one school district per town. And that was called the Vicious Act of 1892 um, because people couldn't believe that they had to consolidate from their one room schoolhouse school board to whole town. So, um, Really, nothing new. The the the, the resistance to consolidation, um, but basically, what's happened is there was a um, a big building boom in the post-war area era, and then in the 1990s when um, the population there was a population boom, and there really has been little to no significant work since the 1990s. So um, there's many buildings you know, that are 60, 70 years old. There's many buildings that have had additions and those are now almost 30 years old. So, um, and there hasn't just been a lot of work done since then. And I, 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 the next slide just shows deteriorating conditions on one of our projects. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty disheartening to see um, these districts are just not able to keep up. Um, there's also, you know, I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that it's not just that the buildings have gotten old, it's also that education has changed. It's changed from teacher-centered instruction to student-centered learning. Um, there's, the schools are providing way more support services than they used to. You know, the school, post-war school had, you know, a multi-purpose room, a small administrative pod, and a bunch of classrooms. So um, now we have school-based clinicians, we have speech and language pathology, we have special ed, we have a whole um, group of supports, a whole, a whole array of support services and they have no place to um, work. My wife is a school-based clinician and her last job, she's working in a gym closet um, while balls were, you know, what gym was happening and balls were being thrown against the wall. Um, this is this is typical. Often they're in copier, uh, you know, storage rooms, sitting alongside copiers. So um, this new paradigm of uh, educational delivery has different space needs than than um, the past. And so the buildings were built for one uh, educational model. That model has changed. The buildings haven't. So it's not just the infrastructure. And I can't emphasize this enough. It's also that education has changed and these buildings have to be modernized. That's why our group is focused on the term modernization and not, you know, infrastructure repair because infrastructure is like the roof, the HVAC equipment, the windows, but that doesn't get at how spaces should be arranged so the kids can learn best and the kind of spaces that should be provided so that kids can learn best. So now I'm going to go to the next slide. Obviously part of the context is declining enrollment. Um, 
And, you know, one of the things that this getting the state involved with school construction would be would also give them a way to um, forward their policy goals um, in terms of that. Um, then finally, we have the, the moratorium where, um, you know, there's been very, very small amount of work done since 2007. Um, and there's a huge backlog of projects. Um, and one of the really troubling aspects of this is the inequity that has resulted um, between towns that can afford to do work on the buildings and towns that can't. And um, that just continues to grow um, wider and wider as time goes on. Um, working with the Vermont Community Bond Bank, I don't know if people have seen this slide before, but um, if you look at the uh, column with the totals on it, um, at the bottom, it's $915 million. That's all of the construction projects since 2008, since the moratorium, plus the ones that are on the books. Now they did include uh, the South Burlington one because this was done before the bond vote, but take that out, you still have 700 million. And there's, they're probably gonna do something in South Burlington. So, so maybe they, maybe it's not 200 million, but maybe it's 80 million. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, right now, if you look at the column, um, proposed in planning, you know, it's like 575 million. And I'll talk about like some other states, I'll, I'll tell you now, like Rhode Island, when they started this process recently, um, five years ago, let's say, they, they were guessing that they had a billion dollars in this kind of need. And it turned out to be $3 billion in need. And if you look at their numbers, in terms of number of schools, it's pretty similar to Vermont. It's not it's not that much different. So, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So this, this slide I think is pretty powerful. This is the next slide that shows the surrounding states. There's only 11 states in the entire country that don't have a school construction program. Um, and Vermont is the only state in the Northeast that does not have a school construction program. Um, so, you know, other states have found a way to finance and support uh, the modernization of schools. Um, and, you know, I, and I know everybody on this call wants to find a way too, uh, but it just, you know, my concern is that we, we fall behind um, in terms of being able to provide uh, quality environments for our kids. So this is some research we did about different states. So if you look at, um, this is the next slide. Rhode Island, uh, its population is nine mil is a million. Our population is six hundred and thirty thousand. They have um, three hundred and four schools. We have two hundred and fifty schools. So it's kind of, um, and you can see they have one hundred and forty three thousand students. Um, we have eighty three, um, but we don't have that many uh, less schools. So they obviously have more kids in their schools per school than we do. Um, and this is the case where, you know, so if you look at, we have 250 schools, they have 300. Their, when they did their study, it came out to be 3 billion. Um, I don't really know what it's gonna come out to be um, for this state, but I'm guessing it's over a billion. Um, so if you look at New Hampshire um, in Maine and Massachusetts, Massachusetts is sort of the poster child for school construction program, um, they have spent since 2007, um, I don't know, like $15 billion on school construction. That's just the state share. They've, that, that has leveraged over $24 billion um, in state construction total. And people say, well, that's Massachusetts. You know, they're, they're a big state with lots of industry. You could round the numbers a bunch of ways, and I have. If you look at it like how much they're investing per person, and you you um, modify that for Vermont standards, you, or you take a penny on the sales tax for Vermont sales tax versus uh, versus what they're getting because their sales tax is probably they probably generate a little more revenue. No matter how you slice it, we would have spent if we were spending at the rate of um, Massachusetts, we would have been spending close to a billion dollars since 2007. And instead the state spent zero. 
Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty uh, harsh uh, comparison. So Mr. Epstein, yeah, this is maybe a good place. You're just about to go into the opportunities. Yeah. Um, why don't we take a pause here? Because um, I do want to give the secretary at least 20 minutes or, or so to speak to sure. the questions at hand. Then we'll come back to your next slide and allow you to pick up. Sure. No problem. Okay. Secretary French, thank you for joining us. Um, the, the two questions for you, the, the first has to do with H209 and um, thoughts on that bill. But in some ways, I think the more pressing question is, Mr. Etkind got us thinking about, as I said before, air circulation systems in schools due to open up perhaps in September to physical um, instruction. So I was wondering if you could let us know what your thinking and planning are along those lines um, and with the understanding that it may be in, in progress, but just uh, as an as a update about where we are now. Sure, good afternoon, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Yeah, in terms of 209, it certainly is, um, you know, was previously described, uh, David mentioned, I was involved uh, on and off with the, the, what led to 209. And certainly I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's an important uh, issue that we have to address at some point. I, you know, I think last year we predicted the interest in lead and drinking water would lead to a larger conversation of school construction issues. And, um, you know, it's not surprising to a certain extent. Um, but it's, it's how to tackle the problem. And I think, you know, I, I definitely support the idea of doing a study, uh, which is outlined in 209. And uh, I think also um, requiring districts to do the planning is another key component. We're seeing actually more of that, I think, now with Act 46, that there is better, I would say, oversight of all facilities uh, as a, a sort of a general observation I'd make. Um, but then lastly, and, and equally importantly, uh, giving the AOE a staff person to administer the program. I think some of you know that previously uh, we had three people uh, administering the old program, just the construction aid program, and now we have zero FTEs in this area. So we would certainly need uh, someone even to manage the RFP prof process to hire a consultant uh, to do the study. So, but I think, I think uh, to, to Treasurer Pierce's earlier comment, there's a certain attractiveness to having it be a rational process, meaning we identify the need and plan for it is as difficult as that is, um, but to really wrap our arms around what the nature of the need is. And as David mentioned, the issue of equity, how we how we tackle that's a paramount concern. As you know, currently districts are approaching this within the, the, um, con, con the modeling of their uh, the education fund. So therefore that those those districts can can afford to do it both politically and financially are going to be able to find a way to do it um and that leaves other other places uh, in a tougher spot so i think you know definitely interested in 209 and um you know this is an issue we're going to have to tackle it's not going anywhere and I would think, you say if before you move on would you say that the the appropriations the amount uh 1.5 is that aoe is supportive of that uh total Yes, I mean, it, it has to be, we have to figure out how to pay for it, but I think, you know, the, the idea of doing a study and hiring someone to do it, and I think, um, I forget how the number was arrived at, I think David uh, had some insight into that with the group, uh, but I think certainly, um, I think from, from my perspective, it acknowledges that we don't have the in-house capacity to necessarily do that, but secondly, it's a, it's a, it can be a politically challenging uh, work. So it would be useful to bring in someone with outside expertise to do it objectively across the board. And we've done that a couple of times in Vermont's history. I, I pointed out at one point, we did asbestos the same way where we brought in a consulting mm -hmm. firm to kind of just go across the entire landscape and sort of do that inventory. I think it leads to a better uh, consistent result. So we'll have the same sort of criteria being applied to all facilities. Um, and I think that that useful data, data would be really helpful in the decision making at this point. Okay, great. And if we could transition to the to the HVAC air system problem. Yeah, so I'd situate that into the larger uh, container of planning for the fall. Um, and, you know, ventilation issues uh, are important ones. Uh, I've worked with Norm on several projects along those lines over the years, something I'm very attentive to when I go in and visit a facility because uh, it's it's a critical element of a successful learning environment. 
um, it is, I think now with COVID-19, uh, it's uh, unfortunately or fortunately situated on a rather long list of things that have to be addressed as a result of planning for the fall. Um, the most recent CDC guidance has this on the list along with maybe 20 other elements. So um, we are in part, you know, uh, underway in a larger planning process to open schools in the fall. As we've expressed, it's our intention to open school in the fall for in-person instruction. Uh, but we know also that we'll also have to be prepared to do remote learning and maybe somewhere in between, we'll call a hybrid model, uh, because we can envision, I think, next year that there will be times when maybe all schools are closed or all schools are open, but maybe some schools are closed and some schools are open. So we have to have all those things planned out in advance. So we, um, as, as more of those sort of uh, plans have become available, and I don't think we're in any different spot relative to other states in the country, we sort of been gathering those elements, both nationally and internationally, of how, how countries and other states are approaching the issue. Um, to distill all this complex work down, quite simply, we started with the public health information. So uh, we had a meeting last week uh, with our health department folks uh, about just in a rough way discussing what, what's gonna be involved in the planning. And then um, I have a weekly planning meeting with the superintendents, the principals and the school board association, Vermont NEA, business managers and so forth. And just the sort of senior leadership of those groups. We've met weekly throughout this emergency. Uh, this week, we're having an extended meeting. We're adding the health people to that meeting and we're starting to articulate out sort of a blueprint um, for how we want to approach the planning process. And I think it'll, part of the challenge is to figure out what, what should be promulgated from the state level and then what should be delegated or um, reserved to the locals in terms of doing their own planning process within a framework. So we're in the process of, uh, you know, starting that work. Um, I think right now it looks like we'll uh, go down a path where districts are going to be required to do a plan, uh, not so much out of a um, regulatory requirement, but more out of an assurance or just out of a planning exercise for their own uh, operational uh, viability. And uh, we want to have that sort of framework launched, I think, by mid-June uh, so folks can take advantage of any end of year in services and so forth with their staff to start doing that work. But there's, um, you know, back to sort of this challenge, I think, particularly specifically on ventilation, it's just one element among many uh, that are going to really require a focused planning effort on the part of districts. Um, and it's the context for the fall is shaping up to be a fairly dynamic one. So it's not as simply as just planning for in-person instruction. It's also planning for transitioning back and forth to remote learning and in-person instruction and what are the triggers and how those decisions get made along the way. Um, so I, I, I think ventilation is important, but it also has to be, I think, situated appropriately in this larger planning context, which will be quite challenging for folks. I, I hear that and, and, uh, and respect that the challenge is huge. Um, I guess what we were thinking was the December, uh, end of December date for completing work on projects that are gonna be COVID funded seems like it would involve, uh, you know, extremely accelerated process. So if the districts are putting together their plans in June or July, one, one question I would have is, to what extent could we expect, you know, are there enough, one of the reasons I asked Mr. Edkind is to try to answer the question of, are there enough specialists to complete that kind of work in six months, um, assuming upgrades, replacements, et cetera. And I know that's all gonna be the fruit of your discussions over the next couple of weeks, but any thoughts on that completion before December? Yeah, I don't know. I think, um, you know, we certainly, from a financial perspective, been looking at both the CRF, as you mentioned, which uh, expires in December, but districts also, you know, have uh, access to the ESSER funds, which go out through September of uh, 21. So, um, and I think we're all expecting uh, additional federal monies to come down as well. Uh, but I think, you know, just in terms of priorities, so much of what we've been doing is sort of a triage, if you will. And, um, you know, you can imagine how complex some of the planning processes are with these interrelated considerations, but there are cases where this planning becomes quite simple. Uh, for example, if we don't have enough supplies to clean surfaces, 
you know, that, that in itself could shut down a learning environment. So you can just take ventilation right off the table for the moment because no one's going to be in the space uh, unless we have adequate personal protection and so forth. So there's, as much as we're contemplating all these different moving pieces, um, my, my expectation is that some of this will be greatly simplified for us on things such as do we even have bus drivers available, you know, and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of practical considerations that I think that will also inform the decision making. But I think, yeah, to the point, of, are there are there sufficient uh, experts available to do the work, to line it up in a thoughtful way? I would say, in a, in, in just assume this wasn't a COVID-19 environment, it would be challenging to do that on a statewide basis. Um, but with everything else going on, I don't see districts having a lot of bandwidth to put this uh, as the focus right now, because I think there's some more fundamental things that are sort of like Maslow's hierarchy going to deserve their immediate attention um, just to contemplate opening schools. I think you're muted, Senator Booth. Questions for the secretary from the committee. Uh, Senator Harvey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Secretary French. Um, and for all of your efforts to plan for reopening schools, I'm heartened to hear that you're gonna require each school to do a planning process, because I think that will help them think through all of the steps. Um, I'm wondering, you know, we've heard about uh, ventilation as an issue for the spread of the virus. And if you're in a room with a bunch of people talking at once, um, that that is, is one of the primary ways to spread the virus. So I'm wondering, have you gotten a sense from, the, from uh, perhaps Dr. Levine or others where that falls on the sort of priority list um, in, the, in the health related realm setting aside all of the challenges of actually getting the projects done? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question, Senator Hardy. I think the issue of, I'll say, group size, which I think we've become familiar with to a certain extent, <clears throat> we've seen uh, specific guidance for uh, childcare settings is sort of the first, I think, toe in the water relative to acknowledging uh, there's a need to bring people together for specific societal purposes. And uh, what are the risks then? And how do we manage those risks? Um, it's not clear to me yet as to what those parameters will be for classroom settings, but we're certainly um, talking about numbers, but, you know, it's also a function of predicting of where we are in the fall relative to the virus, but equally important is to what extent we feel comfortable being able to manage that risk, meaning, you know, what's our testing regime like, you know, uh, how are we able to control the access to the perimeters of the building through temperature checking and so forth. So, you know, we have to, we have to consider the risks and get an understanding of it. We don't know what the risk level will be come September, um, but also as a function of our ability to manage that risk with the tools that we probably will have new ones uh, in terms of testing and so forth by the fall. So if you think about how many students would you fit into a classroom from a public health standpoint, uh, part of that equation would be to what extent is there adequate ventilation in that room. Um, but I think equally important, once again, to simplify some of these decisions will be, well, what's the social distancing aspect of that? You know, so I think, uh, you know, we use six feet a lot. I hear that a lot and uh, from public health folks that there's a um, good reason to keep that physical separation uh, because so much apparently the virus is transmitted through the aspiration uh, of individuals. So to what extent would ventilation help, help or moderate the ventilation or the aspiration aspects? Or I don't know how any of that factors into things. I haven't heard that emerge yet, uh, but possibly it will. But I know um, in many schools that I've been in, there's there's some poor ventilation issues. You can tell with the CO2 levels and so forth. I'm not sure how that, if anyone's done some analysis of how that functions in with contagion levels. Um, but, so I don't know, I guess is the answer, and I haven't heard it from the Department of Health yet. Other questions for the secretary from the committee, Senator Perchley. Do, do you know, Secretary French, but maybe uh, Mr. Whitsby knows this too, is how many districts do have a facility person, a, a building facility? I do not know. Um, I, my uh, observation was that more of them seem to be centralizing those functions, as particularly as a result of merging. I, I've been in uh, just in my own travels and dealing with districts that I've known uh, previously before Act 46. It was my observation that many of them uh, have started to centralize their facilities uh, personnel. 
And I think that's also my hypothesis, one of the reasons this issue has advanced to a certain extent, because I think now we have, in many districts, we have uh, better surveillance on uh, issues across a district as opposed to building by building basis. Um, so it's not surprising to me necessarily that we have uh, greater insight into these issues, uh, but I don't, I don't have a specific number. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any other questions, Mr. Secretary. Anything else you'd like to share with us? No, I think the, the planning process for reopening is, is going to be a complex one. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say we are, uh, you know, we're aiming that in the direction of in-person instruction. And I think that's where the better part of the country is as well. But I think, you know, uh, you should be assured that, you know, the public health uh, and the science of that will be our primary lens by which we make these decisions. And uh, we, I, I feel we have really good expertise on that. We're also reaching out to other expertise outside the state as necessary, but we'll, uh, I think we're in a good place to do that planning, um, not only with our expertise, but you know, in Vermont, everyone's involved in those decisions. So I think we'll come up with a pretty responsive framework uh, to do it as best we can. Well, thank you. And, and again, thank the administration for being science-based. Um, it's, it's not necessarily taken for granted in states around the country. Um, I'm glad that you've added the health professionals to that weekly meeting or uh, the meeting that's upcoming, I, I would be interested in having you pass on to us as they're developed any guidelines you have around air circulation systems, but also more generally the health requirements um, and planning for putting them in place by September, um, because that's something that we should all be having an eye on. Yeah, I agree. It's it's on the CDC list, so by definition, it'll be elevated to a discussion by our group. Um, but I, I I will make sure that's elevated uh, specifically. See if we can address some specific guidance to that issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know you have to go, uh, but uh, thanks for joining us. If you if you can hang around to listen to the end of Mr. Epstein's uh, presentation, feel free. Uh, Mr. Epstein, do you want to pick up with opportunities? Sure. Thank you. And thank you, Secretary French. And I, I just want to say that um, I hope to participate in the conversation about ventilation because I have a lot of experience with that. Um, and I've done and I've done a bunch of reading relative to this, the COVID um, uh, crisis. So I think I can offer some insights into that conversation as well. Um, but let me continue um, just with this presentation. So, you know, the opportunities here are uh, both educational quality and educational equity. I think we, we talked about that earlier. Um, you know, the, um, there's no question, you know, I think if you talk to educators that better learning environments lead to better educational outcomes. Um, not, you know, not only do they speak to the students in terms of um, they're inspiring, but they provide more opportunities. You know, when you think about spaces like maker spaces and hands-on learning opportunities um, and, you know, in a modern school, those, those are um, really part of the educational delivery system. And obviously the educational equity piece. Um, economic development, workforce development, resource efficiency. Uh, all these things are opportunities uh, with the right system. Um, in terms of resource efficiency, you know, the state has a hand in helping shape how taxpayer dollars are directed, helps reduce duplication of effort, effort in nearby towns. And as I said earlier, helps school development um, helps direct it in alignment with state goals. So um, there's a lot of opportunities. As I said earlier, we, we look at this as more of a, a stewardship program for K through 12 schools that promotes um, high quality learning environments throughout the state, not just an infrastructure program. And we think part of that would be um, the statewide survey. So we, you know, we're, we're very much of, um, in agreement with everybody who's spoken about the need for the statewide survey. Um, financial incentives to um, the school districts to modernize those facilities 
uh, criteria to rank the school needs, tying the, the incentives to healthy and energy efficient building standards and um, leadership in a person like a facilities director for each school district. And one of the things I, I didn't uh, go into, but on that table, if you look at it, um, that shows the different states programs, every one of those programs offers incentives to, um, you know, if, for example, if you consolidate schools in Massachusetts, you get more money. If you build to certain um, green standards, you get more money. So some of them use carrot and sticks, but most of them use carrots. They say, here's the base amount. Um, and then there's these adders to try and move schools, districts in the right direction in terms of energy efficiency, sustainability, so on and so forth. Um, so that's another um, way that these programs can work. Um, similar to what Secretary French was saying, the idea that uh, districts should be, uh, be doing their own planning and, and having a master facilities master plan that they update every five years, that there's additional staff um, required to support this program at AOE. And, and finally, you know, we thought that, you know, we're working with a lot of districts um, who are considering um, closing schools and consolidating because they just the enrollments have declined so much and it's just not a sustainable model, the current one they have. And a lot of the conversation focuses on what's going to be lost, but not what's going to be gained. And we thought part of this program, if there could be small planning grants for communities so that they could create strategies for repurposing um, the schools and their communities that might be closing would, would, would help them understand that this could be an opportunity and not just a loss. So these are, there's a lot of stuff here, but we agree um, very much, you know, our group and myself personally very much supports H209 because as everybody said, funding a statewide assessment is critical to understanding what the scope of the issue is. Um, having you know, as it calls out, either whether it's AOE or an official study group to um, create a specific proposal for the legislature to consider in the next in the coming years, and and then help having whether it's the uh, joint fiscal office or the treasurer's office um, work with the study committee to model multiple funding options. Um, is critical as well. And then finding funding um, an AOE position to support this effort. I don't think that is an H209. Uh, I think most of the other things in one form or another are in there. So I think it's on the on the right track for sure. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions people have. Uh, I do have a question about, um, you know, in our initial pass through, we all kind of stopped over the 1.5 million, um, you know, Granted, this isn't something I, I deal with every day in my own work life. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, did you have input into that figure? How, um, how specific did, is that? Yeah, well, no, I think that came from the Joint Fiscal Office and they, um, I don't know where they got their information. You know, there's, there's sort of, I think two paths you could go for this study. One is if, if um, and I think the 1.5 million is, is the better path, which is to build a database um, that could be a working database moving forward for a program. Um, you know, I think if you, you spend, if you spend, let's say you could do it for 500,000 or 400,000, you would get like a snapshot in time. And if, if the legislation took years to develop, it might become dated as um, was said. But I think if you build a robust uh, database that gets populated on a regular basis and it's designed as such, then it's, it's an investment that the state's making that could be used for whatever the future program is. So, uh, um, and I think for that, for that 1.5 million, I think that's the kind of product you would get. It would be a useful tool moving forward. My, um, my Zoom intuition tells me that Becky Wasserman has something to add. Yeah, I did. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I did want to confirm that Mark Peralt from JFO came up with the estimate. 
Um, and he can talk about it more, but I think it was very much um, an estimate. Uh, so he might have new, and this was a couple months ago that he did it. So he might have new numbers now. We did, uh, I think we did hear from Mark and I asked him uh, whether it was um, highly specific or sort of picking a number and he, as he does, he kind of smiled. And um, so I think there's some, a little bit of guesswork there. Uh, but on the other hand, you're talking about professional assessments um, across the entire system. So it doesn't surprise me that it's in the seven figure range. I was just, I, I always wonder over neat numbers, you know, a million, 1.5. Right, right. So, uh, okay, well, anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Epstein, before I go to committee members for questions? No, I'm all okay. Com committee members, questions for Mr. Epstein? Did we, we lost uh, Senator Ingram. Senator Perchlick. Yes, on uh, Mr. Epstein, on your growing needs slide, doesn't have slide numbers, I think it's maybe number nine, but yeah. that summary of historic school construction spending, that was money that was spent, that, that 900, and, well, that 915 to 2023, but if 2019 and above, that's all that was was like approved by local bonding folks. Yeah, something. so the um, the column that says issued, uh, which is 221 million, that I believe is money that um, has been spent to date, and that and then um, in the planning column um, there are I know that the 57 million figure is real, but some of those may be, uh, have not passed bond votes yet. So, um, so why the state hasn't spent any money other than the fact that we have a statewide property tax to fund education, right? Money has been spent on school construction, but just not with any state oversight or support. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. If there are no further questions for Mr. Epstein, I do wanna um, get to Norm Etkind, um, but Mr. Epstein, we're gonna be continuing to look at this bill uh, and I found myself, I can't speak for other committee members, I found myself rethinking my original cautions around it. It seems as though the treasurer makes a good case for it. The secretary makes a good case for it. Both of them found the appropriation uh, in, in line with what was necessary. Um, so it, it seemed to me as though, uh, you know, I can imagine us passing a version that's not so different from that. I do think there is the question of staffing, which Secretary French brought up and which you mentioned, we can pick that up. Um, but as I said to Secretary French, feel free to stay to the end of the hearing, uh, Mr. Edkind, I was hoping could speak to us about his thoughts on what the secretary laid out in terms of um, air circulation and HVAC. And it wasn't really specific enough to, to do much of that, Mr. Redkind. Well, of course, uh, you know me a little bit. I have plenty to say. So um, if you'd like, I can chime in on, on both, uh, both present, yeah, all please. three presentations. I mean, the um, I think we um, H two hundred nine envisions um, uh, the discussion on how to finance these improvements uh, happening three and a half years from now. Now, um, meanwhile, as you know, all these schools are coming forward uh, based on tremendous need and going ahead with projects without any input from AOE, as far as that goes. And with some school districts that desperately need to have this work done, not being able to pass bond votes. So I, I think you need to divorce, um, you know, face the reality of the situation, which is what I just mentioned, as well as, you know, the long-term planning and initiatives and so forth. And that's where my proposal, well, you know, let's help them get over the hump by, um, it's all coming out of the Ed Fund anyway, right now. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but let's let's uh, put in some criteria and let's get some of the uh, incentives going so to some of these school districts that desperately need this work done. And I'm not going to belabor the point because those are my thoughts on that. So <laughs> I'll move it along uh, unless okay. people want to ask so questions of that. It, in other words, um, um, you're muted. I think. Oops. No, I don't think so. Um, in, in other words, can you hear me? Um, you're muted, I believe. No, no, we can hear you. No, he's not muted. I, I think only you can't hear me, Mr. Edkind. Not sure why that would be. Can you hear me now? Can can you hear? I can't hear you. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear anybody else? Can't hear anybody. Nope. Mr. Edkind has lost audio. Uh, yeah, I was going <laughs> to you can't hear me. Um, uh, I had a, no. It doesn't, can't have any, can you hear us now? No. We might have to okay. at least uh, sign I'm off gonna, and sign back on. I'm going to write him. <laughs> you could write I him. Could him <laughs> you bricked him to the chat. Um, okay, I can hear you now. I'm sorry. Well, you can. Okay, great. I want to see your sign, Senator Burke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> what did the sign say? <laughs> yeah. It said, we'll get back to you, but I forgot. The Dear John letter, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's reversed. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I think I might have accidentally pushed on something or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, so all I was going to say is that the, the treasurer was very specific that we should do a needs assessment, create um, you know, an accurate database before we funded anything. You, you take issue with that. Well, um, and I'm not an expert on, on that, but uh, if I understood her correctly, she was looking at how the state was going to pay for this, not how the, the ed fund or the local taxpayers were paying for it. She was focusing on, mm -hmm. on the, the capital bill and how to get money in the capital bill to fund this and or to finance through the capital bill and so on, but didn't specifically address the idea of doing what I said, which is just providing some incentive through the Ed Fund. And maybe, and establishing some criteria for how that's done. Yep. So um, it, it doesn't contradict anything she was saying. Okay. Um, I, it, this is, I'm saying, because the time frame, if I understand it correctly in, in H209, your, your version of the bill is, uh, that discussion happens three and a half years from now. Which none of us liked on yeah. our first read through of the bill. Um, as, as we first saw it, it was a million and a half going out, none of it to districts. And then maybe five years down the road, people see some kind of infusion uh, yeah. or, or at least four years down the road. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't see any reason why we can't think about ways to accelerate that timeline. I have a hard time imagining that we would, at this point in the session, design the kind of grant program you're talking about, but maybe we can ask AOE to come up with that uh, in the coming year and have that working before we get. Yeah, that, I mean, I did run it past uh, one of the best business managers in the state to see if the way I propose it would actually work. Um, and, and he agreed that essentially that, that could happen needed mm -hmm. some tweaking of course but uh but that the, the basic idea was sound it could function the way i proposed um the um but moving right along <laughs> if you like um the, the uh i can certainly sympathize with secretary french the burden on him is enormous and i think what really needs to happen is to divorce this whole issue off his plate and move it sideways to, I suggested a task force that would look at this. Some of the changes that need to happen are, are just changes in the programming of, uh, of their systems. Some of it is uh, replacing filters. It's just getting that guidance out. If there were a task force that can do that, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. Most schools are having work done on their systems over the summer. So it's really feeding into that. And if, uh, if there were some CARES Act money available, I bet some would move quickly to while a lot of this work has to happen over the summer. So yeah. it, um, so they have an opportunity now maybe to do this if this were at all possible. But uh, a lot of it is just passing on, getting the right knowledge to the right people that are already there, like to move it 
kind of off the secretary's desk and into a task force that would work on this and get the idea. That, that was my suggestion there. Appreciate it. Yeah. Questions for Mr. Edkind from the committee. Okay. Um, oh, uh, question from David Epstein. Well, I wanted to just comment that um, the uh, schools, you know, have planned their summer work and it's um, summer is just about here and contractors get very, very busy in the summer. Um, and so it's, um, you know, and then there's some planning time that it takes to put these projects together to figure out what's the best solution. So uh, my, my opinion from my work in the field is it'd be very difficult to do any work this summer other than getting your existing, you know, if you have a project that's already planned, getting that obviously um, shouldn't be a problem or getting your systems, your existing systems working as good as they could possibly work. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a um, field called commissioning and a commissioning agent comes in and tests all the systems and makes sure that they're working properly. And so that, that might be a more feasible option for um, the fall than um, doing wholesale replacement of systems. Now, um, and, and contractors and engineers can do commissioning as well. It's not just, you have to, it has to be a special. Um, the, the unfortunate part is that there's many schools that don't have, um, don't have adequate ventilation and, and or don't have working actual equipment that works. Um, and yeah. so you can't commission something that just doesn't work. But, um, but that would be a start, I think, is, is um, to have all the systems at least tested and tweaked to work as best as they can before um, September. Mm -hmm. uh, Becky, I'm not sure if you're still, uh, there, there she is. Yeah. Um, would you be able to join us on Thursday um, to go into the actual language of the bill and see yeah. what we what we like, what we'd like to save, what we might change, and what we might add? Um, sure. I, I do know that the bill is currently in ways and means. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't know whatever is sent over to the Senate will be what is worked on. I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, understood. Um, but I, I know from Representative Webb, it's their top priority. She's asked me to look out for it especially, so I, I want to do that. Um, it's a subject that I've been um, hoping to make a move on with this committee as well. So at the very least, we can maybe um, get you thinking about another draft. Uh, there was the the point about it, an FTE mentioned for AOE and um, could that person monitor this progress? Um, if we could get that person there and working quickly, maybe that would, uh, rather than necessarily the task force that Mr. Edkind is talking about, maybe that person could just begin conducting that work. Um, and then uh, there was also the piece about standards and developing standards. Um, so maybe we can leave that as is, or maybe it'll need some kind of modification. But I'd, I'd appreciate it if we could have you on Thursday. Yeah, sure. Uh, great. Um, Mr. Epstein. I would uh, agree with Mr. Etkin also about the timeline. Um, anything that we can do, or you can do to shorten the timeline. You know, I mean, this, the study might take a year, but the funding, um, you know, I don't, I don't know why this would need to be a three and a half year uh, process. Um, yeah, I think it's it's it seems too long. I, it was a reaction I had too when I uh, read the bill, and I was glad that um, Norm brought I, that up. I I think you know I I don't want to speak for the House Committee, but I know that they've been moving very gingerly, trying not to um, raise opposition because the moratorium has been in place for quite a while. And it's clear that the ultimate goal is to try to lift the moratorium or a targeted lift of the moratorium. And so I think 
having it be out three years is sometimes a way to make a, a, a soft approach. Right. But, but I agree. And I think the committee as a whole felt that that timeline was, um, you know, not where we want to be. We'd, we'd like to be making change if we're going to make change sooner rather than later. Um, so uh, I believe that's our witness list for today. I want to thank uh, Mr. Etkind. Am I pronouncing that right or is it Etkind? Uh, I know who you're talking about either way, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I appreciate that. And thank you, Mr. Epstein, for being here. Um, you and I had a discussion about this quite a while ago, yeah. so it's, it's good to have it um, yeah. underway. Any, any um, additional expertise or insights that I can offer the committee, I'd be happy to come back and, and do that. Um, so I just want to put that out there as an offer. And we may well, when we're done with our bill, um, have the witness list back just to respond to the final language, just so mm -hmm. we can get uh, a sense of whether we've done our work properly. Right. Um, I, yeah. If you have, I don't know if this is appropriate, but um, I just wanted to share in two minutes some of the some of what I've read about ventilation, just so you folks are aware, because I know this is really important. Um, there was some question initially that schools or businesses should just turn their ventilation off and because it would spread germs around, you know, spread the virus around. And ASHRAE, which is the governing, the body that deals with heating and ventilating systems came out with a statement uh, that said, no, absolutely. You should run the systems you should, and you should run them as high capacity as you can because you, what you're trying to do is dilute the air with as much fresh air as possible. Now, a lot of, a lot of systems recirculate air, at least partially. They don't bring in 100% fresh air. So that would, you know, that would be the goal. An ideal system would exhaust all the interior air and bring in 100% fresh air. Many systems aren't capable of doing that. Um, but so their, their recommendations are to boost the capacity um, the amount of air being circulated and get as much of that um, when you're introducing the new air to be fresh air. Now, the problem, um, the, the issue with replacement of systems is that many schools have the old unit ventilators, those boxes underneath the windows. And almost every project we do, we take those out and we put a centrally ducted system that has heat recovery in it because it's much more energy efficient. And that is a unit that sits on the roof and you have to provide ducting to several classrooms. Well, guess what? That usually means you have to take the ceilings down. And when you take the ceilings down, you take the lighting down and you do energy efficient LED lighting um, and a new ceiling. And so what I'm saying is that these projects sometimes are more system related. Excuse, excuse me, Mr. Epstein, somebody's got their sound. No, um, that was, I'm sorry. I had another incoming call. I just oh, oh, okay. So anyway, I just want to say that it's not just always like replacing um, unit X with unit Y. It's, it's often, in fact, with these older schools, a whole systems replacement where you're, you're changing the technology completely and it gets into other architectural components. And that's why to do this right, you wouldn't want to just tell people to go replace their unit ventilators and their school um, this summer because it's not the right technology. It's a very outdated technology, um, which many schools have. So I just wanted to add that those couple of bullet points there, just so people, when they're thinking and talking about this, have the benefit of, of that information. Well, thank you. That's appreciated. Um, and th again, thanks to both witnesses. Uh, committee, we're coming pretty much up on time. We'll finish a couple of minutes early. On Thursday, we've got two things I'd like to do. One is, as I said to Becky Wasserman, work on the House's actual language um, and in advance of it coming over, um, I think it's more likely that the appropriation will change than the structure of the bill, but we, we won't go too far in our wordsmithing uh, before we get a final version. The second thing, as I mentioned before everybody was here, we did get their Act 173, or I'm sorry, their 
lead bill delay. And uh, I spoke with Representative Webb today. She said that their initial version just changed the date to allow another year for lead testing, but then they got working on findings and some other stuff and it became slightly more complicated. Um, when they went to put findings in, she said some of the findings turned out to be inaccurate and they had to rework on them. So we'll, we'll pick up both of those bills. And uh, you know, I, I guess we're, we're now in the remote version of the end of our normal session where we're working exclusively on house bills. And if 166 goes, over to them, we, we may have the, the range of the bills that we're gonna be looking at. Debbie. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if we were going to take more testimony about the UVM faculty situation. We will, and you know, my, my thinking on that is um, that our committee would not produce a bill um, but that we might work on language to pass to the Appropriations Committee for the budget mm -hmm. um, around. So what went out today in the budget adjustment, at least, um, you know, was COVID money for, you know, replacing hardware, uh, you know, students. Reimbursing the, tuition. Right, that sort of thing. Yeah. What, what will go out the next time will be more... Um, there will be more of an opportunity, I think, to put bumpers on the language. So I'm happy to take a look at that. I do wanna have a chat with Jane Kitchell first um, because I don't wanna just create a bunch of language and have her say, well, we don't do that sort of thing. So I'd, I'd like to find out the exact parameters of what she thinks might make sense and then come back to the committee and have us try to uh, generate you know, those those little uh, paragraphs that follow the numbers in the budgets. Um, but again, being respectful of their bailiwick as opposed to our own. So sh that's the long answer. Short answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. No, that's so thanks committee very much. And uh, I guess I will see you all on the Senate caucus call tomorrow morning. I think we have one. And, uh, and then Thursday for yeah, more of a nuts and bolts on the house bills. Okay, and thanks again to our witnesses. See Good you all night. soon.